Not gonna lie, I'm kinda hungover. Not gonna lie, my head really hurts. Not gonna lie, I don't wanna do this. But you asked for it, so I will persevere. -er. Don't have a word to rhyme with that. You get the idea of this, hopefully. Good morning, metalheads of the internet, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Metal Meltdown. Today, by extremely popular demand, we will be reviewing every single studio album from the one and only Avenged Sevenfold. I am what you would call an extremely casual Avenged Sevenfold fan. I have admired them Primarily from a distance, I have acknowledged the bigger hits, the bigger successes and accomplishments, and I've got nothing but respect for them, but I've never really spent a lot of time with them. I've never really listened to like a big chunk of their discography. And with the new album, Life is But a Dream, coming out in what, a week and a half, two weeks-ish, now feels like the appropriate time to finally dig into this band's you know, massive, commercially successful, Grammy Award-nominated discography. Plus, y'all have been asking for this for a long time, so... Yeah, here we go. As per the norm with these types of videos, I am not interested in EPs, demos, live albums, or compilations. I will be looking specifically at Avenge Sevenfold's studio albums and I will be talking about each in order of release and assigning each a score out of five. First up, we have Sounding the Seventh Trumpet, originally released in July of 2001. It was re-recorded and re-released in March of 2002 to include then-new guitarist Sinister Gates. As far as I can tell, these two versions of this one album are pretty much identical. Maybe a, a set of more nuanced ears from an Avenged Sevenfold connoisseur would be able to listen to both versions of this album and explain to you the many uh, differences in, in production and, and songwriting. But I fucking can't, and as far as I can tell, most versions of this album that you could buy or find on a streaming service are the 2002 version with Sinister Gates, so... Fuck it! More importantly, the album itself is an album. It definitely has songs on it. Yeah. Yeah, that little bit of, of, of trivia regarding Sinister Gates is honestly all I really have to say about this thing. I just found this to be really stale, really forgettable. You know, the dynamic musicianship, the technicality, the, the wild vocal theatrics of uh, later Avenged Sevenfold records, none of that's there. Um, and even the stuff that is here, I just don't think is really well done. Like, there's nothing happening on this Avenged Sevenfold record that another band like, say, Lamb of God, for instance, wasn't doing much better in the early 2000s. There's nothing on this album that you can't hear from, like, another kind of metal, metalcore record in the 2000s that wasn't also done better by, you know, one of those bands on one of those albums. It's dark and aggressive, and I can kind of vibe with that for a hot minute. It's also got more of like a skate punk underbelly to it in, in some parts, which I think is kind of neat. But for the most part, very stale, very like mediocre uh, early 2000s, like metalcore, metallic hardcore. I'm not really feeling it. Yeah. Uh, two out of five. That's it. That's it. By no means a terrible record, but it, it lacks polish and it lacks anything memorable. So yeah, moving on. Next up, we have Waking the Fallen, released in August 2003. And holy shit, what a glow up. What an improvement. What a difference literally a year makes. Holy shit. Way more mature, way more dynamic, way more diverse, way more ambitious, way more brutal, just better written and produced and executed all around. Like, it really feels like these guys were paying attention to what people were saying about sounding the seventh trumpet at that time. It also feels like these guys were kind of looking inwards and really thinking about what kind of band they wanted to be. They were really putting the time and effort into, like, thinking about what their sound should be and, and how they can stand apart from other bands that were starting to get big around this exact same time. It definitely still has, like, its more generic metalcore moments. The album's 
you know, biggest hit Unholy Confessions being an amazing example of that. But it also does have a lot of other moments and a lot of other ideas that you wouldn't find on a metalcore album from like the early 2000s. The two-parter I Won't Stay Tonight, for instance. Apologies, it's called I Won't See You Tonight. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little fucked up. I'm still a little hungover, but irregardless, the point is, this is a cool number. I, I really like this. I like the passionate guitar solos. I like the lush, evocative strings and, and keyboards. I like its transition into blaring, jarring, crippling metalcore in the second part. A lot of other great stuff here too, like Eternal Rest, which has these really sneering, thrashy leads and some super vicious lead vocals. The chorus is like elevated by these almost heavenly synths as well. It does give this like an otherworldly kind of feel and vibe. I also really like Reminiscence, Second Heartbeat, Clairvoyant Disease, which has these slower, moodier, more spacious passages combined with some more cathartic twin guitar leads, very reminiscent of what Avenged Sevenfold would go on to do with records like City of Evil. I had actually never really heard this album beforehand, and I'm leaving it kind of really digging it. I mean, I'm not big on Unholy Confessions, honestly, and I know that might be sacrilege to say because that's one of the album's biggest hits. Other than that, though... I'm, I'm kind of feeling this whole thing. Solid 4 out of 5. Maybe leaning slightly towards a 3.5 out of 5, uh, but a 4 out of 5 nonetheless. Like, it's legitimately a really, really well-made, like, early 2000s metalcore record with a lot of twists and turns. It, it holds up pretty well now in 2023, and if you haven't checked it out, I would recommend you go do so. Next up, we have City of Evil, released in June 2005, and if I have not already angered, irritated, or annoyed the Avenged Sevenfold fans out there, this might be the moment in which I do so, because full disclosure, full honesty, with all due respect, this album, super overrated. Now before you light your torches and sharpen your pitchforks, hear me out, please. Just, just for, just for a moment. I promise you can light them and sharpen them after you've heard me out, okay? You have my fucking word on that, and I am nothing if not a man of my word. There are a lot of good ideas and a lot of good performances on this record. It's bigger, it's bolder, it's more expansive, it's more dynamic, it's very clear that Avenged Sevenfold wanted to capitalize on the more uh, progressive and unpredictable elements of their previous studio album, and they wanted to make something that had massive appeal, but that also had a bunch of twists and turns, and that also was really new and different. And there are moments where they succeed, like Bat Country. That's a bop. That's a banger. Trashed and Scattered as well. Also, great song. But Seize the Day? Yikes. That's corny. That's lame. Or how about Burn It Down? This was the lead single from the album, and from what I understand, even back in the day, motherfuckers didn't like it. And I can see why. And you know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna say it. I don't care. Consequences be damned. Beast and the Harlot, too, also, as well. Yikes. It starts off strong, to be fair, with those syncopated keyboards and, and guitar leads, and I also do love that main riff. Like, that lead riff is so fucking gnarly, so fucking sleazy, so dirty, so badass. It, it sounds like Guns N' Roses doing Diamond Head's Am I Evil, and then deciding at the last minute, no, we need to speed it the fuck up. Double time, motherfucker. But that chorus, oh my god, that chorus is fucking awful. It literally just sounds like something that was ripped directly from some Hot Topic post-hardcore. Like, it does not fit at all. And Matt Shadows' vocals, uh, She's a goddess, she's a demon. Ah. From what I understand, Mr. Shadows reached out to a vocal coach, a gentleman who had himself previously worked with Axl Rose and Chris Cornell. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's great that M. Shadows wanted to improve his voice and expand his range, but the, the, the power, the strength, it just isn't really there at this current moment in time. Like when he's in that low mid register, kind of singing like this, you know, the, the gravel, the rasp, the tone, 
it works, but the moment he goes into those higher levels, like when he starts doing like screams and when he wants to do something more high pitched, it just it just totally falls apart and it sounds like somebody having an asthma attack. This album can be easily summed up as something with a lot of good ideas and good intentions, but just not consistently well made or executed. At its absolute best, it's close to a 4 out of 5. At its worst, it's close to a 1.5 out of 5. I'm going to go kind of in the middle and go for a 2.5 out of 5. All right, now you can light your torches and sharpen your pitchforks. You have held your end of the bargain. I have held my end. Go fucking nuts. Hit me with your best shot. Come at me. Let's go. Let's do this. Next up, we have a self-titled album, Avenged Sevenfold, released in October 2007. And I already know what you're thinking. You're sitting there thinking, you know what? This motherfucker just trashed City of Evil. Why on earth should I pay attention to anything he's got to say at this point? Why on earth? Why on earth would I want to listen to him talk about this self-titled album? He's just going to trash it. To which I respond, fuck you, because you're wrong. I actually really like this album. No joke whatsoever, folks. This album is to City of Evil what Waking the Fallen was to Sounding the Seventh Trumpet. A big glow up, big improvement. Everything that the previous album tried to do, better executed, better implemented, more expansive, more brutal, better produced. Out of all the albums we're talking about in today's video, this one has the most amount of songs that I actually really remember quite fondly from when I heard them as like a kid, as a teenager. Like Afterlife, Almost Easy, Gunslinger, A Little Piece of Heaven. I remember all of these songs really, really well. And I think that they've aged really well. They were fun back in the day. They're fun now. Like Gunslinger has that really emotive, acoustic driven opening. It has this Western flair as well, telling the story of like a, a lone gunslinger just trying to find his way home. Almost easy, afterlife, just gnarly, badass, radio, heavy metal stuff. Chunky riffs, simple but effective choruses, some nice guitar pyrotechnics sprinkled throughout a little piece of heaven. Also, which super fucking goofy, but like, I dig it. To this day, I'm not really sure how to describe A Little Piece of Heaven. It, it feels like November Rain, but if it were redone by Danny Elfman and Cannibal Corpse. Those songs have always been my favorites. They still are. Still lots of other great songs, too, not to, to downplay anything else. Like, uh, Brompton Cocktail is cool. Unbound, The Wild Ride is cool as well. I honestly completely forgot about the closing number, Dear God, as well, which has, like, country twang and southern fried flair with, like, slide guitars and these really rustic sounds and atmospherics. It's really cool. I would consider critical acclaim to be a dud. It's just overly aggressive to the point of being kind of cringe, like I, I kind of roll my eyes, especially as those more rant-like vocals begin to pop up. But I, I do give it props for wanting to call out people who are like unnecessarily overly critical and don't do anything to change anything in society. If critical acclaim were stripped from the record, I would maybe honestly give it like a 4.5 out of 5. As it stands, I'm feeling a very strong 4 out of 5. Just, a, a, again, a massive improvement on City of Evil in every single fucking way. And in my opinion, maybe the best album from, like, this era of Avenged Sevenfold. I'm willing to bet you've already checked it out, especially if you're an Avenged Sevenfold fan, but if for some reason you haven't, go for it. Next up, we have Nightmare, released in July 2010, and I have mixed feelings on this one. This album was made during an especially stressful time for the band. Their drummer, Jimmy Sullivan, nicknamed The Rev, had unfortunately passed away during the writing and recording uh, process. As such, the album was shelved, and the, the fate and future of Avenged Sevenfold was kind of up in the air for a bit. From what I understand, they only continued work on this album when uh, Jimmy's parents came to Avenged Sevenfold and were like, look, this was this was his baby. He would want his baby to live. They were very uncomfortable about finding a permanent drummer at that time. So Mike Portnoy, who at that point had, I, I think, had just left Dream Theater, if I'm not mistaken. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But the point is, Mike Portnoy volunteers to record with Avenged Sevenfold for this album, which in a weird way finds itself being centered entirely around Rev. 
which in a weird, which in an interesting way now finds itself being centered conceptually around Jimmy. As the band would remark in an interview with Hard Drive Radio, the new album Nightmare is dedicated to the Rev's memory, and although it's not exactly a concept album, it does center around the Rev. The eeriest thing about it is there's a song on the album called Fiction, which started out with the title Death, and it was the last song the Rev wrote for the album, and when he handed it in, he said, that's it, that's the last song for this record, and then three days later, he died. Obviously, this translates to Nightmare being a very dark and a very emotional record, driven almost entirely by emotion, and... I think that's great. What I'm not really loving is a lot of the music itself. It just kind of feels derivative of what Avenged Sevenfold have already been doing, and it definitely gives off the vibe of, we just lost someone who's important to us, and we're not really sure where to go, so we're just gonna resort to what we've been doing up until now. Still some pretty cool stuff here, like the aforementioned Fiction is kind of a great song, uh, Natural Born Killer as well, God Hates Us, which I think is kind of an underrated gem from the Avenged Sevenfold discography. I don't hear a lot of people talking about this song, but I really like it. Nightmare and Welcome to the Family are, are fine as well, not my favorites. Uh, the album does start off on a, a pretty lackluster note, in my opinion, with these two numbers, but... You know, they're 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 fine. They're they're more than acceptable. Ultimately, I'm feeling a three out of five. Like I said, it, it just kind of feels like a lot of the band's energy and passion was kind of sucked out of them for this one. But there are pretty understandable reasons as to why that would have happened. And ultimately, I think they still put out like a decent record. Next up, we have Hail to the King, released in August 2013, and um. Uh, uh it's it's an album. It's, it's, say what you will of this record, but it is undeniably an album. The idea here was to do like a stripped down, back to basics, kind of hard rock, heavy metal album, Avenged Sevenfold, going back to their roots, wearing their heart on their sleeves. In theory, cool idea. The execution, uh, yeah. I mean, let's just address the elephant in the room here. They stole a lot of shit for this record. They weren't, not, not influenced. I don't want to hear they were influenced. They straight up stole a lot of fucking shit for this record. And that's not me just saying this to rile up the fanboys for a potential Avenged Sevenfold drinking game. This is a pretty common consensus that critics and fans alike have about this album. Jason Limengrover from All Music, for instance, wrote that the song This Means War was a ripoff of Metallica's Sad But True, and specifically went on to write, unfortunately, once they tried to take inspiration from other bands, they mimicked them so well that they lost their sense of identity in the process. Meanwhile, Tom Whaley on Reddit writes, Hail to the King is totally derivative of those influences. It doesn't present them in a unique or interesting fashion. It's avenged putting on a costume, playing tribute, and making other bands songs. Even Rob Flynn from Machine Head was quick to point out in a blog post how strikingly similar certain parts of this album were to iconic songs and moments from Metallica, Megadeth, Iron Maiden, Guns N' Roses. And this is a guy who's generally pretty easy to please and doesn't care about this kind of stuff. Like, he liked Revival from Eminem. No one likes Revival from Eminem. Not even Eminem likes that album. If I remember correctly, they were accused of stealing the original album artwork for Hail to the King from Lich King as well. And something nobody has mentioned, the title track, Hail to the King, that, that basically just sounds like their version of Thunderstruck from ACDC. Straight up. It's not even just that, like, M. Shadows' lyricism is kind of wonky and all over the place, new drummer uh, Aaron Elijay, the most basic percussion I think I've heard on any Avenged Sevenfold album, or really on any rock album from the 2010s, like, this is some really simplistic, basic fucking shit. This whole thing just feels like Avenged Sevenfold doing a really bad tribute album, and that's not even the only problem. Like, M. Shadows' lyricism is kind of wonky and all over the place. Uh, new drummer Aaron Elijay fumbles big time with some of the most basic percussion I think I've heard on any rock or metal album in the 2010s. Like, I feel like I'm listening to, like, the exact... Like, I feel like I'm literally listening to the same 
fucking drum beat over and over and over again on this motherfucking thing. There are some bright spots here and there, like I think Shepherd of Fire is a decent album opener. It would have fit in fine on Nightmare. Requiem's kind of cool, but yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, honestly, I think I'm feeling a 1.5 out of 5. Like this is just not a good album. It has nothing original to say or offer. It's extremely predictable. Uh, it outright steals a lot of fucking music, or borrows if you prefer, and it doesn't even do a good job at honoring the bands that it's claiming to honor. And finally, this brings us to The Stage, released in October 2016. I'm willing to bet a lot of you expecting me to rip this album a new asshole, trash it to hell and back, because I've been kind of all over the place with Avenged Sevenfold in this video, and also because of my comments on the, the more recent Avenged Sevenfold singles, Nobody and We Love You, which had more experimental and progressive flavors and edges to them. But I'm not gonna do that, because honestly, I think The Stage is kind of great. It's inarguably the band's most progressive album, their most challenging album, um, and I, I think it's actually aged even better now because so much of what this album talks about uh, in its concept has become so much more relevant now in 2023. Like, it deals primarily with artificial intelligence and advanced technology and its impact on society and its eventual you know, path to the destruction of society. And considering we're, we're in a position now where AI is being trained to, like, mimic the voice and the cadence of, like, popular singers and artists, and it can be used to, like, uh, literally spread misinformation, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it's aged fucking well! More importantly, the album itself is just so fucking good, like, extremely well written, Pretty well produced, some issues with the mixing and mastering, but, you know, overall, a really strong record. Brooks Wakerman of Suicidal Tendencies and Bad Religion fame takes over on drums for this one, and honestly, uh, he, he, he fucking goes off, man. He just fucking knocks it out of the park. Like, he saw this as an opportunity to really, like, flex his muscles and spread his wings as a drummer, as a musician, and it's easily some of his best work on any record. The songs across the record as well are, are consistently really well arranged with a lot of complexities and nuance and depth and body. You'll have these regal bombastic horns, these more sprawling orchestral moments and these really dynamic guitar parts. And all the while, it does something that respectfully a lot of progressive metal albums sometimes forget to do. Have fun! Like there's a lot to dissect about a lot of these songs, but there's also just a lot to have fun with. I actually think this is a great record, and I would actually give this a 4 out of 5. You just hate the new songs because you hate it when bands change. You don't like it when bands progress or evolve. No, that's not true. I don't like it when bands make bad music. The stage is not bad music. The songs Nobody and We Love You, however, are. They're also goofy. Especially We Love You. Dollar Store Mr. Bungle ass bullshit. Anyways, yeah, 4 to 5. Great record. And that is it for the Metal Meltdown. We did it, reviewing every Avenged Sevenfold album. My headache is gone too. Nice. Cool. Turns out, talking about cool music was, is, it's all we need to really feel good and happy and healthy. But also, I'm not a doctor, so don't take my word for that. Anyways, now it's your turn to tell me. What's your favorite Avenged Sevenfold album? What's your least favorite Avenged Sevenfold album? How would you rank everything in their discography? What band should be the focus of a reviewing every album style video in the future? Let me know in the comments below. Press this button to subscribe. Look, more videos here. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Join us on Discord. Links for all of that in the description. And as always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.